uh, we uh, will make good use of our meeting time. Um, he hello, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us. This is the Transformative Vertical Flight Working Group for uh, Public Services meeting number 75. Uh, today is June 29th, 2023. Uh, it's uh, amazing that what has happened in the uh, transform to vertical fly environment. Of course, when I say vertical fly, they include in short field takeoff and landing. And what we were able to get today as our guest speaker uh, is the famous Dan Newman. Um, for anyone uh, who hasn't heard about him, as <laughs> you should, uh, he, he's a Boeing Senior Technical Fellow uh, in aircraft configuration development. And he also served as the chief engineer for advanced vertical flight in the Phantom Works division. Um, now we all know that uh, how many work in uh, development, different configuration, different design uh, has evolved, especially in the last few years uh, when the EV to become more of a dynamic environment. But in addition to that, there's also a long history of various kinds of configuration design for vertical and short field takeoff landing aircraft. Uh, in the past, we have this attempt to group them in a uh, VSTOL wheel. And I think many of you are familiar with that. But it could get to a point that uh, with the technology advancement, the enabling uh, methods and design capabilities and com potential innovative configuration coming online, that may or may not be adequate anymore. And so I'm so glad that um, Dan Newman, uh, in conjunction with uh, Air Lawless at Aurora, uh, which also part of Boeing, uh, able to come up with a new simplified uh, taxonomy for uh, VSDL aircraft. Now you have to, uh, Dan, you have to correct my pronunciation, how we, how we should say that word. Uh, but without me trying to say any more than that, uh, the uh, I've seen Dan's uh, uh, presentation of what this concept is. I think it's uh, going to help a lot uh, once we can converge on this better way to grouping um, organizing the different configuring different concepts, not only for design development, also for certification, um, different standards that can enable uh, the advancement of the, this industry. Um, I, I think this is a great effort. Um, so I will let Dan take over. Dan, the floor is yours. All right, you'll stop sharing. I'll, I'll share if you don't mind. I will do that. Let me see, how do I stop sharing? If I can find my control icon. Ah, I see it. Hold on just one second. There you go. Okay. All right, thank you very much for allowing me to share this with you. As you'll go through, as I go through, you'll see, I'll talk about my motivation. I just wanna introduce myself a little bit. Johnny, thank you for the very, generous description. I just want to share um, how this all started. I met Johnny first at the Uber Elevate conference years ago, the first Uber Elevate conference in Dallas. Um, how I got started here was I was for a time the technical director of the, of the AHS, now the Vertical Flight Society. And we had the first transformational vertical flight conference uh, in Washington, DC, and uh, might be a little hard to see here. Let me move the screen. Um, pink shirt, I'm in the middle. Uh, Joe Ben Beavert, John Piasecki, Mike Hirschberg, uh, Angelo Collins, who's now the new VFX director is here. Susan Gordon, Johnny Dew is somewhere. Since he's tall, I expect him <laughs> to be visible. Mark, uh, Mark from- uh, Mark Moore, Houston. yeah. Mark uh -huh. Moore. Um, significant number of advocates for a significant number of capabilities here. It was really exciting to be there at that meeting. Daryl Cummings, 
Um, Ashish Bagai is here, a significant number of notable folks, Steve Ritzy of NASA with Acoustics. Great opportunity to speak with a whole bunch of people that you surely recognize. Um, and that was just the first one in 2014 from which Uber Elevate and a couple other things occurred, which was exciting. Um, and over the years, we started with the idea that electric flight could help and distributed propulsion could help. Um, but there has been a challenge. And what I want to do here is share with you something that is at some level opinion and some level vision, uh, but I don't get to decide. And so it requires consensus from the industry if we're going to get the regulators to adopt anything. And so uh, for this next 25 minutes or so, I talked to 120 knots and gust to 320. So uh, I'll try and get this in to make you aware of what we did and how we got here and why. Uh, it began as I have a column in VertiFlight Mike Hirschberg gave me to talk about terms. And through three columns over three magazine uh, issues, the terminology evolved with feedback and Al Wallace got in touch with me. And over the last six, seven months, we have had a robust conversation of how to describe these vehicles coming at it from two different perspectives. I'm an aircraft configurator by trade, fortunate to be a senior tech fellow for Boeing in aircraft configuration. And Al is a flight test guy, a pilot, and is chairing the EVTOL, VFS EVTOL flight test committee. So we come at this from different perspectives and we don't necessarily agree on everything. We've had weigh in from a lot of other people and we don't get to decide. It's gonna be interesting consensus. So the goal here is to present it to you, draw feedback, draw flack, improve it and move toward an interesting consensus, whether it's this or some subsequent iteration or something that replaces it because it's better. I'll explain the motivation. Feel free to interrupt if I'm not quite clear or save your questions toward the end. I'm confident I'll save time for some questions. So today I'll talk about, quickly talk about the motivation, the history of VTOL and VSTOL aircraft, the current language, the interpretation of the language and why that's consequential, why a taxonomy is needed, and then I'll go through the taxonomy and next steps. So the taxonomy is sort of the hook slide at the end, but I think by the time we get there, you'll understand the motivation. Um, so since VTOL, since there's been viable manned VTOL, we're a, you know, not quite 80 years since we had really successful manned VTOL on a regular basis, primarily government sponsored for all the new ideas, but there has been the desire to take this basing flexibility, this hover or VTOL capability and add it to very long range and very high speed. You'd call that the holy grail. It's very expensive. There's good reasons for it. Um, I like to say that runway independence is uh, taking the runway along with you. It's an onboard, offboard trade, and the aircraft is more costly and more complex, but it removes a bunch of ground support equipment, and in this case, it removes the runway. So this came about because the nomenclature is unclear. It turns out that the historical, the, at least the V-stall wheel is built based on what was done and not what could be done, and that left some gaps. And then innovation continues. As you know, over 800 uh, concepts with over 600 companies on the eVTOL news, some practical, some not practical. Um, but the goal here is not to make judgments about feasibility or practicality, but to come up with a categorization that is useful. And then to discuss it in terms of the regulatory challenges. And we used, we're using our language very carefully because we don't want to step on any statutes. We want to identify the gaps, suggest some additions, and then if industry is so motivated to agree on things, then we might be able to move the regulators toward that as well. Um, so I'll talk about the history. The first real good categorization, 64 by John Campbell of NASA. You can see here there's four rows, which are different types of flying, and four columns, which are different types of propulsion systems. Uh, aircraft tilting, tilting the thrust, deflecting the thrust, or using two separate systems. And this in general is good, but an increasing disc loading to the right, but there are challenges with it. And I'll go through those. 
But this is where we started, and I'll explain why there are issues with it. But in general, it talks about how we do vertical takeoff and landing, right? Lift over weight, and how we do cruise, thrust over drag. And for some of these, they fly different ways. Down at the bottom, they used one picture. But in general, we're talking about both hover and cruise. And I'll talk about why that's a challenge and why we go a different way. And then early on, the next iteration was the McDonald Corporation. And this was theoretical, quite a bit theoretical. It was based on all concepts being researched, but not necessarily flying. It also includes VTOL, like helicopters. Um, and it has many unreal concepts, as we've shown. But it was early on, you know, power density was low. Um, technology was not there. We didn't have the tools we have today. So a really good first iteration of the VTOL and VSTOL wheel. They called it the VSTOL aircraft summary. And a later iteration, now there's many iterations in between. I happen to have a CD here with many of the intervening ones. I don't have all of them. I'd love to get all of them, but this was done by Centra Corporation by someone we know, Mike Hirschberg, before he became the exec director of VFS. He was also supporting DARPA. I had the, op, the, the pleasure of working with him. And he developed this over the years and it became the Centra VSTAL wheel or the VSTAL wheel of aircraft and propulsion concepts. It is based on just about every single one of these got the flight test and flew. And that's fantastic. Unfortunately, most of them crashed, but the truth is every airplane being tested has ever crashed if you were really pushing the envelope, including all the fielded aircraft. Every have blue for the stealth fighter crashed. So crashing in flight test is not necessarily damning, but unfortunately this has been called the VSTAL wheel of misfortune, which I think is an unfortunate name. We need to push back on that because it's really a great set of lessons learned in terms of the ways that you could do VSTAL and cruise. What's interesting is only four of these ever made it to fielding, three US and one Russian. Um, so they were fielded with the military at great cost. They're costlier than conventional takeoff and landing, but they bring basing flexibility. The Marine Corps has been the lead in the US uh, on three of these aircraft because they are the runway challenge service along with the Navy. Um, but it also included the power plant. So mixed in here was how you power these aircraft. And that creates a lot of complexity because when it comes down to it, how the shaft power gets to the propulsor could be done in a multitude of different ways and it doesn't change the aircraft configuration. So I admit that this started as an aircraft configurator's view, my view, and then over time it added Alan's regulatory view, but, but I'm gonna talk through this. So the current regulatory language, as you probably all know, there's aircraft categories, which is the use of the aircraft. There's classes of aircraft. The upper half is the conventional runway, CTOL fixed wing and the lower half. Now those categories are mine, but those five categories are the FAAs. And I'm limiting this FAA, but there's also EASA, UK CAA and Canada CAA. And then there's pilot privileges, again, broken into fixed wing and VTOL, and then at the bottom, two other categories that are orthogonal to those. And then the pilot rating class. Again, the top half is conventional and the bottom is uh, vertical flight. And then the power plant quantity is also a set of ratings. And so this is where what we start with. And then enter the eVTOL. And I, it's not really eVTOL, it's distributed propulsion concepts and electric propulsion concepts. One of those is the configuration and one of those is the power plant. And at some level, those are independent. You might have reasons why you overlap them, but a distributed electric is the choice to do both distributed propulsion and electric propulsion. And I'll come back to that. So this chart is a, a, a set of the regulatory terms, airframe, rotorcraft, gyrodyne, gyroplane. These are in the published FAA documents. Uh, and then there's orders, which instruct the employees how to use them. And then there's this category of hybrid lift that allows you to talk about multiple systems. What's conspicuous by its absence is the word rotor. Now rotor is used in the non-bolded script to describe but there is no definition of rotor. And if you might notice one of the 
at least one of the columns in VertiFlight is about the definition of rotor, and there continues to be disagreement. Dr. Dada of uh, University of Maryland and I have had extensive conversation, and Al Wallace and others, and so that remains up in the air, and as I've said, I don't get to decide. I just want to move the industry toward a consensus. Um, this chart's actually out of place, but it talks about emerging regulatory definitions and the rules set forth. Pilots must obtain ratings specific to powered lift. And so you bring in here this powered lift category. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, with the FAA making a, a change just last year to, to decide to use the powered lift category. Now I want to talk about why a taxonomy and lexicon is really needed. And I think you may know, but I've put it into words, right or wrong, always welcome to get feedback. So this is the same chart with the words that are an issue highlighted. Um, you can see the use of the word rotors, where it's not defined. We can see the use of the word principally, which is gray area. Again, rotors talk about engine driven. It talks about how it's powered and why as how it's powered as significant as the configuration. They should be orthogonal. And then down at the bottom, propeller. And then powered lift. This powered lift category is specifically problematic because it's focused on the use of a wing in cruise. So arbitrarily, if you add the wing to a configuration, which does almost nothing in the low speed mode, as a matter of fact, it's a problem in low speed, you have changed the category of the aircraft, which doesn't make much sense because now there's this discontinuity between some kind of complex vertical flight aircraft without a wing. And when you add a wing, you put them in completely different categories and you lump the wing one in, wing, winged one in with many other craft, aircraft that are very different that have a wing. So this, this powered lifter category may have been well intentioned, but it's a bit problematic. So again, this is a summary of the words that are a challenge. Um, the novel concepts with distributed propulsion are not really covered. And then axial thrusters, devices that are not a rotor are also not covered. Rotors not defined, powered lift is problematic. There's excessive use of the words principally. Now at the bottom, the intention of the regulators was unclear, but ascribing motives to other people's actions is a minefield. So I don't wanna go into their motivation. I just wanna go into what they have and why it's an issue. Now let's go back to Campbell's categories and apply the existing definitions. So in the existing definitions, the only two of this 15 shown here out of 16 that are rotorcraft are these two that don't have wings. Um, the power lift category was created for the 609 tilt rotor back in the 90s when it was the BB 609 Bell Boeing before Boeing got out and then Bell got out. It's now the AW 609. It, that's why it was created, but it was never really finished. And it turns out it applies to 12 of these 15 categories. So that doesn't help us very much because it lumps just about everything into one category. And then we've got this multi-copter not included because it's not using rotors per se. And therefore all of these multi-lift don't even fit into the current FAA categories, which is the reason, you know, EOS is doing the SC VTOL and FAA is trying to come up with new categories. So that's the basis for why we really need to do this. Um, and the consequences, these parts supply to legacy aircraft. There's a lot of open area. And if you lump all of these in as an exception, that's doable, but two consequences of making these exceptions. One of them is the workload is extraordinary for the regulators and therefore they will never catch up. The second consequence is that there is no formal database or means of compliance reuse between these individual categories. Now they may reuse the compliance, but there isn't, it's, it's not really an ordered approach. <laughs> and we believe that the components can be defined so that an aircraft is an aggregate of specific components. And then every time you re reuse the components in a different way, we can reuse the means of compliance. And you'll see that toward the end, it comes back. Um, so an, again, another article, this is a report. This is a OIG report from the FAA, the Inspector General. It came out just last week. Um, and the conclusions, the aircraft have unique features that do not fully fit into FAA's existing airworthy standards. I mean, you'd think that they were reading my presentation already. 
So this tracks very well. It agrees that the FAA has a problem. Bottom, the bottom highlighting each aircraft has unique features, both compared to traditional aircraft as well to each other. So the goal of this taxonomy is to give a lexicon of terms that we can adopt and get the regulators to adopt and to help us and them. So what's the new terminology, how we do this? So we wanna develop a common lexicon, efficiently communicate, now it's physics-based. We're not going into intent. Again, we're going into the physics of the aircraft so that you could very clearly put it into a category and not worry about what they were trying to do. Establish consistent rules and standards packages, set the bar high, allow purveyors of aircraft to plan ahead and have reliability to innovate and negotiate. Rulemaking takes years. So we've, we've tried to stay away from certain terms like class of vehicle and come up with some new terms so we're not fighting the regulators. We don't think that they should, this second bullet from the bottom, this, this aircraft make model series taxonomy um, we don't want them to employ, we, they could use that order or they could come up with new statutes, but that's their call. Um, seek industry consensus. The approach is to use set, set sensible interpretations, not directly challenge existing terminology, support long-term rulemaking. It's based on the propulsor lift and cruise applications. Um, bypass terminology, so we're not gonna use classes or categories for pilots or for aircraft. And then we, at the bottom one is a key one. We wanna seek industry consensus on this or some subsequent taxonomy so that the regulators have pressure to use it. And it's not just two guys making a story, okay? It's not about us, it's about the industry. Um, now here's how the taxonomy starts. It's only about the vertical lift piece. That's important. We're not yet concerned with how it, how it converts and how it cruises. So we're not even worried about the wings. The wings are a feature of the airplane, but they're not fundamental to low speed flight. And now we're talking about propulsors. The word propulsion is very confusing. So I pr prefer to use propulsors and power plant. Propulsors are the devices that take shaft power or torque and they turn it into thrust. That's a propulsor. How you get that torque from energy storage, energy conversion, transmission, uh, direction changes, speed changes, everything up to the torque that gets to the propulsor, I consider power plant. Whether it's an engine, hybrid electric, totally electric, motors, batteries, energy harvesting, solar, drive systems, inductors, all of that falls under power plant. And none of that is covered by this taxonomy because we consider that orthogonal. You can make independent choices between electric propulsion and distributed propulsion. One is a configuration description and one is a power plant description. And then we talk about propulsor type. Once we've said we're talking about propulsors, we break those into axial thrust propulsors, those capable only of axial and then off axis capability. And I use the term rotor Inter interchangeably with off-axis, but I probably shouldn't. I should stay away from the word rotor. Off-axis is something with like cyclic control that allows you to generate moments and, and off-axis forces with the propulsor itself. That's not veins or nozzles after it. The propulsor itself is an axial system or it's an off-axis system. And just to be clear, it's independent of how many propulsors you put on it. So in this taxonomy, a hexacopter and an octocopter fall into the exact same category and a quad rotor. They're all axial devices using distributed propulsion. And we're not getting into how many of them yet because they all tend to fly the same way. No power plant. We're not dealing with handling qualities yet. And we're not talking about conversion or cruise. So we understand this doesn't cover the universe, but it covers a very specific slice. So I'm starting into it. Go to the top right corner. It's basically the four forces. I apologize, it's flying to the right. I should make it flying to the left because that's conventional. But the two red ones are what we suffer, drag and weight. 
trying to overcome weight, we're trying to overcome drag. And the, the other two are what we actually go do and what the aircraft needs. It needs lift to get off the ground vertically and it needs thrust to overcome drag. And that terminology is what I'm gonna use throughout. So let's come back to the middle. It's based on low speed flight forces. I already told you what it's independent of. The primary factor is how the propulsor is installed on the aircraft. And there's only two ways to do that. It's either fixed in lift or it's able to do lift and cruise, period. That's our premise. There's two ways of generating vertical flight. It's with a device only for vertical flight or a device that can also provide thrust. And under that thrust category, that lift cruise, there are three ways of doing it. I can tilt it, I can articulate it, and that's a little confusing, the ornithopter, that was a messy one. It, Al, I spent six weeks trying to figure out how to fit that in. Or we vector it. We have an axial device and we do something with the exhaust afterwards. So those are the three categories of lift cruise. And you can see here it's, presented with left cruise on the left and lift on the right. And I'll explain the colors in a minute. So just as an example, a lift system, good example is a Black Hawk helicopter and a good example of a lift cruise tilting is a tilt rotor. That's the first premise is that I can break, cleave the world into two. And then I can cleave the lift cruise into three. I'm gonna move on, okay. So the next question, oh, my build is really bad, so I'll skip it. My next question is, once I've got a device, I've got a thrust device, whether it's tilting or fixed, whether it's lift cruise or fixed, there's two kinds of ways to do that. It's either what a, a rotor, an off-axis capability, I should use off-axis here and not rotor, or it's an axial device. And if it's an axial device, it's got this whole range of disc loading, right? It could be a propeller, a fan, a turbofan, a turbojet, or a rocket. And these are all, except the turbofan, these are all examples of lift devices using different types of thrusters, cold or hot. Now, I'm sure you got comments. I'm sure you got questions. I just want to get through the premise, and I'm glad to take feedback and expand it, because that's how Alan and I got here, was one of us threw it over the fence, and the other said, well, you missed something, or you're lumping things together. And that, that was the subject of our debate. So this will take a while to process. I'll give you the charts. So this is the second level down is what kind of a thrust device is it? Now that I know how it's installed. So I go back here and I've got my two categories, lift, cruise and lift. And underneath them, you see I've got rotors and axial thrust. And then I got axial thrust and I've got rotors and, and it gets really confusing. And I've created all of these boxes. And this next chart is an alternate presentation that said, I'm just gonna make the thrust device rows. So now the thrust device is on the left side of the chart with rows and the installation is the columns. So you can see, I've, I've, again, I'm trying to cleave the universe into a bunch of different things. And in theory, you can throw things into here. You know, a quad rotor would be a lift only propellers. Okay, so that would be, let's see, right over here. Lift only propellers would be quad rotors or an octorotors and Hex or hex octorotors are here um, and so on. And you know, uh, Elon Musk's rocket in the old McDonald DCX is here. It's a vertical lift system with just rockets. Okay. So now I move on and I say, I've got these two devices, but what I wanna do is it gets really interesting because now I can have more than one. I can add these two together. And you'll notice it's cute. I've got red and yellow makes orange. Uh, I've got lift plus lift cruise. And that's where I'm going to add a dedicated lift system because I don't want to have to lift the whole aircraft with my lift cruise system because cruise thrust is so much lower. I've got an L over D of say, say five. I only need 20% of the weight of the airplane in thrust. So I'm going to make my lift, syst lift cruise system only capable of cruise. And now I need to augment it in lift. So I've got a lift plus cruise system. An example of that is the F-35. It's got a lift fan, plus it's got a nozzle doing lift plus cruise. So that's my first combination. And I make that orange. Now I got a second combination. What if I add a thruster to my lift system? So a compound uh, like the Sikorsky Boeing Defiant or the Lockheed Cheyenne or um, uh, an autogyro. 
uh, Pitcairn's auto gyros. That's got a lift system and a cruise system. So I combined them. That's the second one. I've also got the ability to add a cruise system to a lift cruise system. What if I, I want to go far faster, like a folding tilt rotor? I'm going to put the rotors away and I'm going to use a separate cruise system for cruise to go even faster. So now I've got two more combinations. And the interesting one here is that I've got five systems. I got five combinations, two pure and three combined. So now I'm going to show you, I got, I'm going to show you, I've got this virtual sixth system, which is where the cruise, it's a little confusing. And that we, we used to have this on here and we pulled it back off. So I just want to go through it. So in theory, I've got helicopter lift system and I got tilt rotor lift plus cruise. And I've added a lift plus cruise category. So I got Pitcairn's auto gyro there. And I've added a cruise plus lift cruise. And that would be like a folding tilt rotor. And then I've got a lift plus cruise. So I've got these five different colors. And the F-35 is my example. And what happens is, let, let me go back with these five categories and see how Campbell did. So the first column is my rotor craft. Good. Remember, the ones with wings are now rotor craft because I'm not worried about the wing anymore and sticking it in power lift. And then these three on the right are various versions of axial thrust. The first column is my lift only. My last column is lift plus cruise. And my middle column is lift cruise. One is tilting and one is vectoring. So, so of, out of my five categories, four of them are covered here by Campbell. Very cool, right? Very, very cool. I'm in very good shape in terms of my categorization and Campbell tracking each other. So again, I've got my two primary and then I put this sort of virtual fixed cruise only. That's really airplanes, but, um, and then, I, and. I, it's a little hard, so I decided we're going to make this a circle. And Al Wallace mentioned the color wheel. So we got my three primaries, red, yellow, and blue. And I've got my combinations. I've got one combination in green. I got one combination in purple. And I got one combination in <coughs> orange. So now my three primaries and three secondaries are a wheel. Cool. Al and I hit on this. V stall wheel. We've got a reinvented wheel. Excellent, but there's a problem. I want to get into it my thruster type. So let's say, remember, I had these thruster types under lift, and I made these my radials that go all the way from a rotor, low disc loading up through rockets, very high disc loading. And I got the same thing for cruise, and I'm going to make these radial divisions, and I can make radial divisions on my lift cruise. Good, good. Now I'm, now I'm adding detail. It's still the wheel, but there's a problem. Problem is, let's use an example of the F-35. When I want to make combinations, the F-35 is lift fan plus lift cruise turbojet. So how would I do that? Okay, so let's put my lift fan, that's third one in, and my lift cruise is the third from the center, my fifth one in. But how in this orange dot do I show that? I can't it gets really messy when I want to start to do combinations. So the next iteration we had, an epiphany, was to change this circle to a triangle. So now I've got my same color wheel yellow with striations, and I've got my cruise one with the same axial thrust types, and I've got my combination of lift plus cruise, and you can see that every single one of these trapezoids gives me the option of combining any lift system with any cruise system. Now I do the same thing. I'm gonna take my tilting, tilting all these same types. And oh, by the way, I extend it because I don't just have the tilting types of thrusters. I've got these ornithopters and these vectored. So I've got this really complex way of doing lift crews. And I could add those as well. Now I add my details on lift. I add my details on crews and my details on lift crews. And now I've got, trapezoids that can represent any combination of a lift only system, a lift cruise system, and a cruise only system. So now we've come up with the V-stall triangle. And it populates very well. This is where the V-stall triangle comes from. Now, Alan made a really good iteration to it. And he said, um, 
I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So it's the V-stall triangle. So what did we do? We took 116 different existing aircraft or concepts. This is just 26 of them, so it's readable. And we decided to test our theory. So we've got the organization and the platform name. And then over here, we got three columns, yes or no. Does it have lift? Does it have crews? And does it have lift crews? And with that, we had an equation that said, okay, which of the five categories does it fall into? It only falls into one of them. And then we said, okay, does it fall into the FAA's rotorcraft category? Some of them did, but none of these, none of these 26. Are they, do they fall into the FAA power lift category? And if they don't, are they neither? And you can see that just out of the 26, four of them don't fall into that category. Now over here is a little more detail. If it's a lift system, I said what type it is and how many. This is the first time I'm actually considering how many. If it's a tilting system, I'm putting in some detail. <clears throat> so this is really the detail of the concept, but none of that matters in air taxonomy. But that's capturing the details, right? A cruise system, how many of them? And then over here on the right are some other interesting things, but they're not currently part of our taxonomy. Is it a tail sitter or a tilt wing? Is, do we use weight shift? Um, do we have a fixed wing? And so on. And there's a correlation between the fixed wing and the power list category. But all of this stuff is details to differentiate. And, and to be clear, when we expand the taxonomy to take into account how many propulsors and what kind of an engine it is and so on, we can get there. But the taxonomy is limited to this right here and these categories. So let's go back to my triangle and take those 116 and plot them on here. The ones in yellow are the ones that fall into rotorcraft. And you can see they all have a rotor, a lifting rotor, right? They all fall onto this yellow angled one, lifting rotor. And then the white ones all have a wing. They're all the powered lift ones. And you can see they're all over the place. And that's really the demonstration that the powered lift category isn't helping. The powered lift category is actually confusing. And then these green ones are the ones that are not covered. And most of the multi-copter stuff is in here. Lift only, distributed lift using propellers and fans, some of them using rockets. So, and then there's a whole bunch here that are under powered lift just because they have a wing, but they're rotors and propellers that tilt. So I'm gonna, the next chart is where I take this. And instead of giving you all these dots, I'm just gonna summarize how many dots are in each box. Oh, before I go there, I just go back to that the four that were fielded, and I'm showing you where those four are that were fielded, right? And then I'm going to go in here, and now I collapse down how many are in each box. And again, it shows you a power lifter all over the place. There's only a couple of rotorcraft along this line. Interestingly, nobody would ever use a rotor just for crews. That's what this horizontal row is, using a rotor just for crews. And Alan and I debated whether we pull that off. And I was pretty adamant that we should leave it on. We should not be making judgments about what you should or shouldn't do. But the absence of anything here shows that it's probably either not feasible or not practical. Okay. So let me move on a little bit and say, so we've got this one. Now, it turns out that because the cruise category, really, there aren't any vertical lift aircraft in the cruise category. The cruise category used to be at the bottom. Alan made the recommendation that we flip it over, blank that out, and use those five categories and call it the V-stall V. So we've moved from the V-stall wheel to the V-stall triangle, and now the V-stall V that has got the five types of categories. Now, of course, you could combine more than two, but that would make our head hurt. So we're sticking with just five categories based on two pure installations and three combined installations. So what we've got is the V-stall wheel with this V-stall V. That's what we've reinvented, <coughs> excuse me. And what are the next steps? So, <coughs> excuse me, as I said, this started with three articles in three columns in VertiFlight. And after my first one, Alan sent me a note and that's how we started the email conversation that led to this <coughs> taxonomy development. And anyone else is welcome to play, join on, be part of our team. We've got this taxonomy. We, we had three articles. We're waiting for more feedback. 
<coughs> we briefed it at the forum. I gave an aircraft design session and Alan led a special session. I gave a lunch and learn just two days ago to the local chapter. I'm briefing, this should be checked. I'm briefing you folks today. And next, in a month and a little bit, Johnny and I working with Carl Russell are gonna brief it to NASA's AEWG. And I don't know what the future is and I welcome as much retransmittal as possible. And, and, and I'm gonna talk a little about regulatory, but Alan is really the one. What Alan has been proposing I'm going back a little bit now. Alan is proposing that we come up with names for each of these boxes or regions, like AxiCraft or VertiCraft. And I'm all for it, but I'm not including it because it's, it's a bridge too far until we get this thing demonstrated. And then Alan is perfect to give a presentation on how we should add some names to regions. And, you know, if we have a vehicle that's using this turbofan tilting, we can come up with regulatory guidance for, for um, means of compliance for that and means of compliance for every one of these. And then anyone who has a new design could simply do an erector set of means of compliance. We still need to add the handling qualities piece and the transition and cruise piece. Now, maybe our, our V becomes three-dimensional and we have some, some kind of taxonomy going up that talks about power plant and whether it's electric or hybrid electric. And we have some taxonomy talking about flight control and transition, but the goal was to get the vertical lift taxonomy clear. And so, you know, that next is my last chart. And basically we have got a concept. We'd like to promote it. We'd like to improve it or have it replaced. And then we'd like the industry and industry consensus to drive the regulators to make it easier for us. So regulation of new concepts is easier and more predictable. And with that, I'll close and open it for questions. Thank you, Dan. Um, folks, I think now you understand why I'm saying that uh, it's gonna take some uh, work for any of us to fully absorb this proposed um, thought process and the configuration presented here. But uh, I think you, by, by just following what Dan was uh, talking about, <clears throat> you can, even if you don't quite get every detail boxes uh, fully sorted out yet in your mind, we can still think um, the, you understand the logic and the approach could really uh, help the industry um, and the regulator to sort out a more um, systematic way to deal with the features and uh, behavior uh, or the characteristics of this kind of all, all kinds of different design and configuration. Hey, uh, so everybody, um, uh, just so I'll, I'll go ahead and mention that. Uh, the, the last meeting, uh, the next meeting that Dan was talking about, uh, we have uh, set up an arrangement to invite all the uh, transformative vertical flight working groups, uh, one, two, and three, and four members to join uh, in on the, uh, with the NASA AEWG working group meeting on August 3rd. Uh, which will be uh, uh, one hour later than our meeting here. So it will be at 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Saving Time. Uh, we will send out meeting invites so you have another chance to engage uh, if you missed the opportunity in in-person meeting today, uh, but you look at the video recording or uh, look at the uh, presentation files, want to engage further uh, the August 3rd is the next opportunity. Uh, we will send out the additional uh, meeting invites so that everybody can uh, engage. Uh, uh, I, I want to be clear. I am ex extremely interested in feedback, darts, comments, improvements, um, offers to go off and do the power plant taxonomy. You know, um, this is this needs to be a collaborative effort. I don't get to decide, we decide um, and what it, what takes root. So um, as Johnny said, there'll be an August 3rd presentation where I reprise exactly this. 
And I think Alan needs to weigh in, probably do a follow-up presentation on what new terms he would present for the regulators that could capitalize on this taxonomy to make it easier. Oh, hey, hey, Al. Hey. <laughs> hey, Al. Hey, Alan, how are you? Uh, good to have you. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a, another Boeing meeting until just a few minutes ago. That's um, that, that's not a surprise. So not, we, uh, we do meetings. Uh, I put together a, a proper technical paper that walks through all of this and includes very clear statements of the language. Um, the, uh, we, we had a couple new terms uh, that I wanted to propose just to clear the air. Um, and most of it is the structure of how you would describe an aircraft. And most of it is absolutely natural. You know, where we say lift plus cruise, it's that sort of a thing. And um, as, as uh, Dan mentioned, you know, for instance, uh, the Joby aircraft, it's six lift plus six tilts. And if you wanted to identify the, the uh, actual kind of propulsor, it's six lift props plus six tilt props. Done. So it's absolutely natural, nothing exotic, uh, but it's just high, it's very organized. Um, so anyway, there is a, a full paper that's already written. It's out there. It's, uh, VFS has published it. We can uh, share it with anybody. Uh, but it describes this in great detail, walks you all the way through it, and makes it super easy, and it has all the graphics. Perfect. Uh, perfect timing, too. Uh, glad you were able to join us, and uh, so that everybody can see who they're talking to. And uh, um, I just want to make sure that everybody, please feel free to, uh, if you don't have these two gentlemen's email address, uh, just email me, contact me. I will be happy to provide that. I'm sure those two gentlemen will be more than happy to hear from you guys. Um, I'll put now, my email in the chat. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there you go. All right, perfect. Um, I guess I get to ask uh, ask one question. It, is it envisioned that the with the three primary color? <laughs> uh, I, I can follow that one. With the three primary color and then the three in between colors, is it possible that by doing this uh, and establish the acceptable uh, uh, approach by the industry, the the, mean, uh, the means of compliance in different elements or different features in the primary color zone can easily be cross-fed into the combined configuration in other words it's not as if we will be we will have to come up with a brand new um uh, industry standards uh, SAE, SDM standards and many of the features or um a regulatory um means of compliance that's uh, being accepted on uh, some of the airplanes that in work but we can borrow many of those because once established some in my mind seems like they can we can combine some of the key features or means of compliance from the primary color zone into the other color zone uh, if the airplane fall into that. Is that the intent? Or well, is that the yeah, intent? yeah, yeah. It's, I would say it's model-based. You know, The purpose of a model is for reuse. You use the model, mm -hmm. you build a model, and then you reuse it. And if we, if we are smart and the regulators are, are creative, they can build modules for the components that can be built into an erector set Yep. And then based on the configuration, it will have configuration specific compliance issues, but the components themselves, the power plant and the propulsors and the way the propulsor is used could be modular. And then we could build a means of compliance for future aircraft modularly and it's mm -hmm. more predictable because you'll know what it takes to show compliance for a module once there's a history of three or four other people certifying that module yeah yeah we're all thinking the same thing you're exactly right John. okay good 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 yeah because you know to me that if we don't do this uh the industry don't have enough resources together to get all the airplane through the system and yeah. fa or uh, the elsa uh cac will definitely not have the resources for sure to try to do it one on one basis uh, and, uh, the, and yeah the systematic module approach seems uh, in essential for the industry growth. Yeah, yep. we're not suggesting that, you know, we have part 23, 27, 25, and so forth. We're not suggesting 
a hundred new parts for each one of those little spaces. That's mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. What we're saying is, like you said, it's a menu thing. If you have these features, you want these means of compliance tests. Mm -hmm. you yep. features, and you just mix and match. But right. yeah, as we collect the data, it all starts to come forth. This provides the structure, the framework for understanding it all. Sounds good to me. Uh, anybody else has questions? Uh, we still have a few minutes. Uh, let you guys ask the question. Excellent. It was yeah, I think, I, I think I, you, you know what it is because that's exactly what happened on my first uh, chance to go through what you have talked about. It, it, I was just sitting there trying to absorb all that information, try to right. think of, okay, what do I, uh, you know, what question should I ask? You know, it took me a while to, uh, I'm yeah, still I, in the process of absorbing all that. Yeah. Yeah, I would suggest you share the video. We have a follow up. You focus yeah. it on Al's going to go the next step and say what, how we, you know, what name, what names we should have for different regions of this, and how we would do an erector set of means of compliance and and all the regulatory benefits that can occur once you adopt something, whether it's this or an iteration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, so everyone, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other people uh, in our working group and, and all the working groups uh, will be interested in dive into this much more in depth. So we'll make the material available. Uh, we'll make the video uh, recording available so we can go back through. Um, I know I have to go through uh, more than once in order to even barely to start to be able to comprehend <laughs> the value yeah. and, and the ingenious that go into this effort. Uh, now, is the cycloidal, that's like a lifter or thruster? Yes, it's, it's, like, a, and, it's like an ornithopter flapping wing. We, we had trouble with that and we said we gave that as a category of lift thrust because once you install it, it's got the capability to generate both. Yeah, okay. I'm, it's, it's not hard to wrap your head around the whole thing. <laughs> good, it's good. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to run, but I thank you very much for the time and look forward to questions, comments, anything that will help us move this industry forward. Absolutely. Yeah, we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to get all our members engaged um, in various ways to uh, contribute, to help, or, or pointing fingers at other opportunities or challenges. Um, uh, and let's get our effort behind this effort. I think it's an exceptionally worthwhile thank uh, you. effort. And thank you guys for doing this. I mean, really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. We, and with that, I think we are at our time. And uh, anybody who uh, we will have this video recording available uh, within a day or two. Um, and then I guess you can make that uh, presentation file available for our yep. members as well. Yes, I will send that to you and or send it to you and Dan and you can figure it out. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. And especially thank our two speakers here. Um, and we'll have another opportunity to engage uh, directly online on August 3rd, but please feel free to engage uh, directly, uh, contribute uh, any which way you can. So. Thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.